Welcome tonight. Thank you for those of you who could be here in person tonight, despite the seasonal Lubbock October <coughs> weather. Uh, while our time was not good with the weather, it's also, I'm not sure whether you'd call this fortunate or unfortunate in the timing policy-wise, uh, that we did this on the day when Lubbock is taking a step backwards and how opened up it is because of current hospitalization rates here and reverting back to a higher degree of lockdown. Um, let me briefly, just very briefly, introduce our three speakers tonight and not take up too much time with introductions so that we can get on with the material. Uh, I'm Benjamin Powell, I'm the Executive Director of the Free Market Institute and also a Professor of Economics in the Rawls College of Business. Uh, our second speaker will be Dr. Alex Salter, who is also an Associate Professor of Economics in the Rawls College of Business and a Comparative Economics Research Fellow at the Free Market Institute. Our third speaker is Dr. Gilbert Burdine, who's an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine and a doctor in the Division of Pulmonary Diseases and Critical Care at Texas Tech's Health Science Center, which means unlike Alex and I, he's a real doctor. Uh, he's also a faculty affiliate of the Free Market Institute and has partnered with us on numerous things over the last eight years that we've been here on campus. Uh, I'll also say this at the outset for, for the three of us. Uh, we're each expressing our own views related to some aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, these certainly do not represent the views of Texas Tech University or even a policy position of the Free Market Institute per se. The Institute has a diverse collection of scholars, each with their own opinions on this. Uh, these are ours and nothing more than that. Uh, that said, the three of us, I selected to participate in this because over the last eight months, we're probably the three associated with the Institute who have uh, written the most commentary in the media, appeared on TV, the most speaking about issues related to the pandemic, and thought it was time to share some of that with the Lubbock and Texas Tech community as well. Uh, I'll also say that we're expressing views about public policy. These are not synonymous with what my own or their views might be about our personal risk preferences and activities that our families should be undertaking, or how anybody should be running their business or educational uh, university. Uh, their public policy. With those disclaimers out of, way, out of the way, let's get ourselves started. What I'm going to do is walk us through what I'll call the economic way of thinking as applied to the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, let me make the brief case or the standard economic case for some form of regulation for this. I'll say at the outset that there is no good outcome to this. There's going to be lost lives. We're going to curtail activities that give our lives meaning and pleasure. And there's people who are going to lose their livelihoods who provide the goods and services to engage in those activities. This is true with a strict level of regulation or with zero regulation, because with zero, of course, just in response to the pandemic, people's behaviors are going to change to curtail activities. So no outcome is a good outcome given the existence of COVID-19. It's a matter of working our way to the least bad outcomes. I'll also say at the outset that preventing all deaths is not an optimal solution. And we do this in the context of our regular lives all the time. We take on risk in order to engage in activities that we find beneficial. Some of you might have braved the cold and walked here tonight. There was a certain risk that you'd slip on the ice or get hit by a car on your way here. You chose it was worth being here in person, despite that risk and unpleasantness of walking. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the optimal level of accidents is always going to be zero. Some will take place in that context, but for the most part, there's those risks that I just described are internalized to you as making the decision of whether to come here or not, and you bear both the benefits and the costs. The case for economic regulation or regulation in the context of COVID is that some of these costs are what economists call externalities or spillover costs. When you engage in activities that you find beneficial, you contract some risk of contact, contracting the disease. And you account for some of that by your own hesitancy to want to have the disease yourself. But when you contract the disease, you also then become able to spread it on to others. If you're not accounting for the cost of those, potential cost of that disease on somebody else, you're going to engage in ineff inefficiently too much risky activity where you're more likely to contact the disease and spread it on to somebody else. Now it's not to say, but this isn't saying that you should not be taking on any activities where you might contract the disease. It's just saying, because you don't account for your extra spillover cost of then passing it on to somebody else, you're gonna do inefficiently too much of that activity, leading to too rapid a disease spread to too many people. Now, to some extent, you mitigate this if you do care about the welfare of others when deciding to undertake which activities. 
So the classic, you know, I'm going to visit grandma in a week. I'm going to restrict what I do to lower the probability that I get infected. This is effectively internalizing part of this decision making. But unless we treat every stranger in society with the same regard that we do our own grandmothers, our activity is going to be inefficiently too much. And some of this will be a classic externality that spills over to others. This is the Econ 101 textbook take on this, where the social marginal costs uh, exceed your private marginal cost of engaging in activities, and we get too much of it. So, before moving on, though, we also have to realize the context of these and how we partially internalize these externalities. So, businesses care about others infecting you because you care about others infecting you. Take a look at the picture up there, the woman with the leopard print shirt and the face mask in the front. The value she places on being in that seat depends on numerous things, including where she wants to go, how much she wants to get there, how pleasant the experience is, but also how risk at risk she thinks of having the disease transmitted to her by the person in the white shirt or the strapless shirt, behind, the sleeveless shirt, excuse me, behind that or any of these others. Well, that means, a, a, in this case, the airplane with any business with multiple customers in it has to weigh the benefits for customers of being comfortable and able to do the activities they want against the cost imposed on customers of being fearful that other people are going to spread disease to them and figure out the optimal way to mitigate this. So classic, as we know, on airlines now requiring passengers to wear a, 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 a mask uh, in order to lower the risk of spread. So this is partially internalized because the airlines profit. If they get the policy wrong, they're going to be less profitable than other ones. So they have to weigh both of these against each other. Class, it's a classic externality, just like, uh, or much like thinking about smoking in bars or restaurants. So a smoker might not care about their secondhand smoke on another customer, but because the other customer doesn't like being in the smoky place, the bar owner has to account for both the pleasure of the person smoking and the displeasure of the secondhand smoker in places that still have smoking freedom, like Lubbock, uh, and set policies accordingly, whether it's non-smoking, smoking, or smoking in non-smoking sections. Same thing is going on here. Now, the difference with the COVID externality, though, is the secondhand smoke stays within the bar. When the smoker leaves the bar after he put out his cigarette, he doesn't all of a sudden spill secondhand smoke into the next place. With COVID, if you go into one bar or restaurant or any place of business where you're at risk of contracting the disease, the business has an incentive to do some mitigation because customers don't like it spill over to each other, but any risk you take on there, you then spread when you go on to the next one. Think about it if you're in the depot district here in Lubbock and you go into the library and have a few drinks, and then you move from there to Triple J's. Part of your increased risk that you acquire by being in the library spreads over to the customers in Triple J's too, which makes them have to invest even more effort at mitigating against that. So there's still going to be an externality here, but it's partially at least internalized when we're in places of business. And the entrepreneurs have to grope to find what the best way to regulate it within their businesses are. So there still remains an externality, but let's wait before we jump to what type of regulation to think about. So in the case of COVID, it's well known now that the size of the externality in terms of how bad is the cost going to be if you acquire the disease varies tremendously by age and health status. So to simplify it, older and sick people bear a much higher cost when they get the disease, both of the severity of the infection and the mortality, than young, healthy people. Also, activity, the benefits of activities, they're going to vary by age too. Tell a, a retired person that they have to stay home and engage in less pleasurable activities is different than telling a single mother who's trying to feed her kids by going to work that she has to stay home and can't provide for her family. Uh, so, We've known since Coase, he's the older gentleman that we see up there, that externalities are reciprocal. If a tree falls, and if a deaf man cuts down a tree in the forest, there is no noise pollution. Add a second person who can hear in the forest, and now when a deaf man cuts down a tree, there's noise pollution. Who caused the externality? Well, the guy cutting down the tree made the sound, but if it wasn't for someone to be there to hear it, there wouldn't be an externality either. The causality of the externality goes both ways. So we can't think about this as merely people or who are at lower risk spreading an externality towards people at higher risk. The activity of a person at higher risk creates some of that externality too. So if transactions cost are low, people can bargain their way to efficient solutions regardless of who is given the rights to do what. But we know transactions costs in this context are going to be extraordinarily high. So classic law and economics approach to this says when this is going to be the case, rights should be assigned such that the externality is imposed on the person 
who at lowest cost can mitigate its size and change their behavior. So thinking about that in co the context of COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID and lockdowns, it seems pretty obvious to me that government policy has got this exactly backwards to what standard price theory should be saying to do. So lockdowns basically correct the externality by making young productive workers stay home this is extremely high cost. We bore this cost in March and April. Meanwhile, allowing them to work makes life riskier for older retired people. Older retired people staying home, going out less, shopping at particular hours, having more food delivered. These are your lower cost avoider. They can curtail activity in a way to lower the burden of the externality on them. Much easier than the much larger population of working age who bears very little cost from getting the externality relative to them. So baseline take on this, so take one is, government got it exactly backwards in the United States and most of the rest of the world when they imposed severe lockdowns because they assigned the right on the externality in the wrong direction. That doesn't mean in and of itself that they should do nothing. It says blanket lockdowns are bad from an economic perspective thinking about this. So next is, well, should we do lockdown light, which is essentially what we have to varying degrees around the country now. Or, another way to put it is command and control mitigation of the externality, where the government tells you which activities you can undertake and not in order to lower the externality. You can have your bar open, but it has to serve food. You have to have one, drink, one uh, entree for every drink. Your restaurant can be open at 75% capacity, 50% capacity. These are all versions of lockdown life where the government is imposing rules that does something to shrink the size of the externality but does so by telling you exactly what you may or may not do. In other contexts, economists are almost universally against command and control to correct for externalities. Take a classic example like pollution. Instead of the government telling you exactly how to produce what form of energy or manufacturing product in order to lower the uh, pollution that comes out of your smokestack, economists almost universally recommend taxing the externality or using tradable permits. For our purposes, we'll just use taxes for right now. So that it lowers the quantity of the externality being done, because when you raise price, you lower quantity, but then leaves to the firms the decision of how to mitigate to lower the externality so they pay a lower tax. That way, they have businessmen, entrepreneurs, can innovate and decide, discover what are the lowest cost ways to avoid this. So what would be the context in, uh, or in, in the, the, what would this look like in the context of, of COVID? Instead of blanket telling us what we may and may not do, setting a tax rate system that taxes ex activities done by younger, healthy people that generate significant externalities in terms of spread that varies by degree, but doesn't prohibit activities. You want to have your bar open? There's a bar surtax you must pay in order to do it. You want to have your arena 100% full? There's a graduated surtax on having your arena filled. This is going to result in arenas being less filled, but still giving the option to be there if that's one of the more valuable activities to take place, which is probably doubtful in the case of tech football this season, but you never know, it got a little bit better this season. Maybe tech basketball on the other hand, I'm hopeful. Um, as an upside as well, then you could use the revenue to dedicate, to, to dedicate it to some of the negative effects of the externality on others. So this could be to compensate older, sicker people who are bearing more of the cost, attach a, a surplus to their social security checks for the duration of the pandemic so that they can better pay for food delivery and other things. Uh, it also could be to invest in things that lower the cost of the externality, increased hospital capacity in places that are taxed, uh, more funds uh, for innovation that get better treatments on worker, what have you. That said, and now, by the way, I think I started with very standard price theory things, and as I progress, I'm going to get what I would say less and less consensus views as I go. But what I had just described as an optimal solution to this is exactly how welfare economists in the 1960s addressed externalities. They find an externality that say this is the optimal government response to it, therefore government should do it without ever asking will that actually happen. Virtually everybody associated with the Free Market Institute to a greater or lesser extent has studied public choice theory, which asked what's the government actually going to do if we give them the power to do this? So what do we really think the chances are of do what the economic scientists say is going to be what drives policy when government decides how to address this externality? I severely doubt it will carry much weight. 
Instead, we'll see the exact things carry weight that have over the previous eight months. People's fear, bureaucrats' fear, politicians' fear, interest groups demanding favors for themselves over others, and demagogues in, the pol in politics and in the media. H.L. Mencken's definition of a demagogue was a person who says things he knows to be untrue to people who he knows to be idiots. And we've seen no shortage of that from the media or politicians the last eight months. I expect if they tried to implement some sort of optimal COVID tax as a policy, we'd get the exact same thing. So taxes would be imposed incorrectly, uh, preferentially in favor of some businesses and against others, based on criteria other than efficiency, much like we saw during lockdowns when mom and pop shops couldn't be open to sell the same things that big box retailers were allowed to sell. How would they allocate the tax funds? Also, by interest group decisions rather than uh, actually a, trying to address and mitigate the externality, just like we see in the so-called stimulus bills where the lion's share don't go to COVID. Instead, the latest one they were debating has a whole bunch of money for teachers unions who aren't teaching their classes in person and bailing out states who spent too much money long before the pandemic. I expect the same problems would be there with trying to do this via tax policy. So while I think that would be better than the command and control approach and certainly the mass lockdown approach, I still think what we'd get is a version of government failure that's probably worse than the market failure of leaving this alone to start with. So what's the best I can really hope for? And I'll conclude with this, that some of these things have been done to some extent. Uh, Deregulate to remove barriers to medical competition and innovation. So this warp speed of fast approvals for vaccine, I think is a step in the right direction. Uh, ditto with uh, improved approval process for new treatments. Uh, and actually, I think on testing, we've been way far behind. The government watched the original version and also the approvals for at-home use cheap, cheap testing have been held back. Uh, greater approvals for those things. All of these things would be things that kind of lower the value of the externality. A vaccine, even if perfect, is going to lower the spread, uh, improve treatments, lower the cost of the externality for anybody who does catch it. Uh, Really, as this process plays out, we're going to need an entrepreneurial adjustment process where businesses continue to try to figure out how to best serve cons uh, consumers who have heterogeneous risks, objective risks, and risk preferences. Uh, in the process, we all need to remember to be kind and respectful to others, to others who have different risk profiles or risk preferences than us, uh, and for businesses that are trying to figure out how to best suit serve them. A business who tells you to wear a mask is not violating your rights any more than when they put up a sign that says no shirt, no shoes, no service. So be kind, be respectful. If you don't like it, don't go to that business, go to another one. Uh, that's an entrepreneurial process being played out. The outcome's still gonna be inefficient, it's still gonna be deadly, it's still gonna be bad. There's no way around that under any of these scenarios as far as I can tell. Uh, I think the good news with it is that over time the externality is gonna get smaller. And a do-nothing policy gets closer and closer to optimal. So why does it get smaller? Well, over time, as more spread among the community, we start to build immunity in people who have been exposed through infection. As vaccines get out there, to a greater or lesser extent how effective they are, we build immunity that way to lower transmission. And as treatments get better, the cost of getting the disease in terms of the bad outcomes goes down. Because everything I've actually said logic lies about the spread of COVID throughout this lecture, since I haven't been parameterizing these things with actual costs or numbers, the logic of it applies exactly equally to the flu. The difference is the cost of the flu in terms of the externality is much smaller overall. Over time, COVID starts looking more like that, and something that looks like the nothing that we do for flu policy is close to optimal in this. It's not now, it's going to be an ugly path getting there no matter which way. With that, I'll stop and turn it over to Alex Sullivan. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. Thank you for joining us on this uh, chilly and more than somewhat inhospitable evening. So Ben did a really good job of giving a general economic overview of COVID-19. I want to focus on one aspect of the policy response to COVID. I want to focus on monetary policy. I want to focus on what the Federal Reserve, which is the Central Bank of the United States, what they've been up to. And uh, I guess I'm sort of giving away my conclusions with the first two words of my slides. They've been up to no good, as I'm going to argue. They've been up to some quite mischievous things. All with the best intentions, of course, but I think we all know the phrase about where the road 
Let's start with the basics. And before we get into what the Fed did in response to COVID, we actually have to go back a little bit and think just for a couple of minutes about what they did in response to the last crisis, the global financial crisis that started in 2007 and really was full, uh, full blown in 2008. But before we go there, let's just think at a basic, uh, basic level, what is monetary policy? If you read in a financial journal, in the Wall Street Journal, in any sort of business section of the, of the newspaper, that the central bank engaged in expansionary monetary policy. What does that mean? Well, the textbook answer is that the central bank, using its prerogative to print money, printed money and bought an asset with it. With the newly created money, it buys an asset. The people who sold that asset to the central bank then deposit those funds in the banking system. The banking system now has more liquidity in it. They loan out more. That's going to cause that new liquidity to circulate throughout the economy. That's going to put upward pressure on prices, upward pressure on sales, employment. It's going to be a shot in the arm for the economy, basically. So that's a very quick version of what we mean by expansionary monetary policy. I want to caution you. The orthodox story is not actually about interest rates. So if you go back to that same uh, Financial Times Wall Street Journal article that I was hypothetically mentioning, chances are the reporter is going to say something like, the central bank cut interest rates this week we need to stop right there. Classically, right, lowercase of orthodox monetary policy is not supposed to be about interest rates. It's true that expansionary and contractionary monetary policy have an effect on interest rates, and the central bank does use what we call the federal funds rate, which is basically the rate that banks charge each other overnight for quick liquidity. The Fed uses that as a target for implementing monetary policy to sort of gauge how tight or how loose things are. But a target is not an instrument. Usually instruments are not used by central banks to implement monetary policy. I say usually because that changed following the global financial crisis. The Federal Reserve, as part of its strategy in fighting the global financial crisis, decided to switch from what we had before, which is a, uh, what the economists call a corridor system, to a floor system. And those are technical terms. All you really need to know is now, monetary policy is primarily conducted by the Fed getting together and changing one of its administered rates. Not a market rate, which is what we were talking about before, the rate that banks actually charge each other for overnight loans, but now the interest rate paid by the Federal Reserve on excess reserves held by the banking system. In brief, if they get together and decide we want that to be lower, you're paying banks less money to hold on to money, in theory they should loan out more and that should stimulate the economy. So that's the basic regime change. Importantly, that's an administered rate. That's not set by the market. Of course, the Fed has to pay attention to market conditions to know what to do with the interest paid on excess reserves, but that one can be decided by fiat, whereas previously, the interest rate that they used to gauge the stance of monetary policy was a market rate. And as we're going to see in a couple of slides, that is a difference that makes a difference. What's the difference? Apparently, I'm going to tell you uh, the difference a little sooner than I thought. The short answer is, under the old system, if the Fed bought too many assets, if it increased the money supply too much or too fast, there would be inflation. And economists still regard inflation as undesirable, so that's bad. We in the economy don't like it when it gets too high. Central bankers don't like it when it gets too high. And so there was constraints on the money creation process. That constraint was eventually we're gonna create inflation. Now, however, since we've embraced a system where the central bank can create money and buy assets with it and then pay banks not to lend out the money, the link between the size of the central bank's balance sheet and the overall price level and its rate of growth has been broken. The Fed's balance sheet can now become arbitrarily large, which is just a fancy way of saying they can buy whatever the heck they want. And as long as they keep on paying interest on excess reserves, that new policy is not going to create inflation. I'm going to read this quote by Charles Plosser, who's a former um, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, I believe, yes, Philadelphia. Quote, once the demand for reserves is satiated, there is no limit in principle to how big the balance sheet or volume of reserves can be. Next part's in bold. This is the kicker. A large balance sheet unconstrained by monetary policy is ripe for abuse. Congress and an administration would be tempted to look to the balance sheet for their own purposes including credit policy and off-budget fiscal policy. The last part of the last sentence, off-budget fiscal policy, is essentially what the Federal Reserve has been doing, overstepping their mandate, and that is not good for anyone except perhaps the politicians whose special interest groups benefit and some central bankers who are eager to expand their mandate.
For everybody else, this is not good, capital N, capital G. So here's a quick graphic to illustrate what's going on. This is the size of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Is there a laser pointer I'm supposed to give in this one? It doesn't show up on this screen. Okay, of course. I should have realized that. The first uptick you can see, the shaded gray areas, that means a recession. That first shaded gray area is the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis. You can see that that's the point where the Fed's balance sheet just first exceeded $1 trillion. Actually, after the recession was over, you saw another continuous rise in the size of the Fed's balance sheet, basically the total book value of the assets they hold, up until it was just over $4 trillion, it looks like. Uh, that's because the recovery was very, very slow, and the Federal Reserve was embracing a lot of new policies to try and get the economy started. It was stubborn. Even though it wasn't actually in recession, it was not performing as well as our central bankers would have liked. And then we get to the right side of that graphic, the second gray area, that's the current one that we're in right now, the COVID recession. And you have a big, big discontinuous spike in the size of the balance sheet until now we're above $7 trillion. So again, that means that the amount of assets owned by the central bank exceeds $7 trillion. Right, so we've gone from under $1 trillion before the financial crisis to over $7 trillion. That's a big change. If we were under any system, anything like the old system, that would have materialized into massive inflation. One of the reasons it hasn't is because all this money, right, whenever the Fed expands its balance sheet, that means that money is being printed and putting out in the economy somewhere. In this case, in the economy just means sitting in bank vaults. It's not circulating, it's not pushing up prices, it's just sitting, earning interest. Because that's what the Fed did to stop the banks from owning it out to prevent the inflation from materializing. Now that we have that background, we can actually talk about COVID. And we can talk about this very quickly. So the Fed has done a mixture of traditional and non-traditional activities to fight the economic fallout caused by the pandemic. In their defense, most of what they've done is, or is orthodox monetary policy. They've bought assets. Right? That's exactly what we want the central bank to do under our normal theory of open market operations. They bought treasuries, they bought mortgage-backed securities. I'm less okay with the MBS stuff. I'm not a huge fan of the Fed using mortgage-backed securities as the asset they use to purchase to conduct monetary policy, but at least it has a precedent going back to the last crisis. Uh, there's some revived 2008 era programs, but the real action, the stuff that I want to focus on now, is on the bottom of this slide. The Federal Reserve has completely innovated with some of these policies. We are covering genuine new ground here. And this break in policy represents something that I think is going to be ominous for years, if not decades to come. What are some of these no, new programs undertaken by the central bank? We have direct lending to large corporations, small and medium-sized businesses, and state and municipal governments. These aren't asset pur purchases in the traditional sense. Unless, of course, you count it as buying an IOU, which is a legitimate way to think about a loan. But in terms of what this is, this isn't designed to get liquidity going in the economic system. This isn't designed to get markets the, the, uh, the liquidity they need to perform at their optimum potential. This is direct credit allocation. This is the Fed saying, hey, you guys are in trouble. Your books don't look so good. We want to help you specifically. Not markets in general, specific players. The Fed, in short, is picking winners and losers. We have a word for the direct resource allocation that comes from policy like that. That is fiscal policy. This is no longer monetary policy. We normally think of fiscal policy being done by Congress. Normally it, normally it is. De facto, what the Fed is doing right now is Congress's job, just by another name. In terms of the economic effects and the way it works, there is no difference. So this is a snapshot of the Fed's balance sheet as of October the 19th, I think. Yes, October the 19th, which is the most recent data that I had when I was making these slides. So I just show you this because I want to make clear, all the new stuff, that's in green. Right, the blue and the red, that's the traditional activities. So there's been a lot of activity, but let's be clear, the new stuff isn't that big. Off of the total amount of assets totaling above seven trillion, the new stuff that I just warned you about, is only about $20 billion. In percentage terms, that's pretty small. So why am I making such a big deal about it? The answer is precedent. This sets a very worrying precedent, which is when the central bank thinks that markets are in bad enough shape, they can abandon the monetary policy playbook that we have had in this country for almost 100 years and decide that they're going to start doing Congress's job 
Remember, the traditional definition of monetary policy is giving markets liquidity. You're not supposed to care about who eventually ends up with the money. You're just supposed to get it into the economy in as neutral a way as possible to support basic liquidity conditions. These programs are not that. These programs are the Federal Reserve buying the corporate debt of Berkshire Hathaway and Coca-Cola, companies that, shall we say, were not exactly having a hard time in response to COVID-19. Undoubtedly, they were having a little bit of a hard time, right? But these are not companies that are in any danger of going under. And if they were, that's not the central bank's business. That is the business of the people's representatives in Congress assembled. Making those decisions is supposed to be what our representatives do. The central bank, which is many, many, many degrees removed from democratic legitimacy, is picking winners and losers. That's not okay. It's especially not okay when you realize that the Federal Reserve is actually among the least politically independent central banks in the world. Well, isn't that great, right? Wasn't I just talking about a democratic deficit? Don't we want more democratic decision making? Not so fast. Politicians love giving out goodies to the interest groups that support them, the coalitions that support them, but they don't like paying for it. So if you're not going to pay for it now in the form of taxes or later in the form of debt, what's the only other way that you can mobilize resources to advance a political project? Printing money. Now that the Federal Reserve has demonstrated a willingness to engage in de facto fiscal policy, politicians have a very, very strong incentive to use the Fed's balance sheet as an instrument for building coalitions and advancing partisan agendas. This is absolutely not something that we should want if we care about economic stability. The whole point of responsible monetary policy is that it's supposed to be about general economic conditions, getting markets the liquidity they need to operate at their full employment level of output. Now, even though the programs are currently small, we have opened the floodgates to a scenario where politicians can put formal and informal pressure on the Fed for them to finance whatever it is Congress wants them to talk about that day. And keep in mind, the Federal Reserve is the institution in society that has a monopoly on the creation of base money. In layman's terms, that means that they can create dollars out of thin air like that and do whatever they want with them. Giving politicians access to a snap button that gives them purchasing power is very dangerous. I think that we've seen with the size of the deficit over the past decade that we can't exactly trust politicians to be fiscally responsible. How much less responsible do we think that they're going to be when they can finance their activities with this hidden inflationary method? I, for one, regard these developments as very ominous. So yeah, happy end of the talk. Right? <laughs> very bright. There are things that people can do about this. We need to raise awareness, we need to contract our elected officials and ask them, are you okay with central bankers doing your job for you? I'm not. I don't think the American people are. I hope we see much more discussion about this in public forums in the future. Thank you for your time and attention. Well, uh, I congratulate all you brave people who came out to hear this. Um, I apologize for reading, but if I just uh, try to talk extemporaneously at my age, uh, we'll all be here until tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to stick to the script. <laughs> you have heard a presentation on the economic costs of COVID-19 lockdowns. You have heard another presentation of the adverse consequences from the financing of this cost. I hope to persuade you in the next 15 minutes that the lockdowns did not save any lives may very well have cost lives. The Fauci strategy was based on faulty assumptions. The strategy was appropriate for a virus like Ebola that is poorly contagious and very lethal. The strategy requires directing a large effort in containing each individual case by individual quarantines. The COVID virus proved too contagious to contain quickly. The strategy evolved into a decrease in transmission via indiscriminate lockdowns necessary to make an individual quarantine strategy possible. This was the plan when Fauci declared that lockdowns were necessary until the case count had decreased to zero. The necessary assumption that the virus could be eradicated through containment turned out to be incorrect. Even the most brutal of lockdowns exercised in Australia failed to eradicate the virus.
Cases resumed as soon as the lockdowns were mildly relaxed. Assurances that normal activity could resume after a few weeks of lockdown have evolved into demands for indefinite lockdown until a vaccine can rescue us. It was asserted that the live save would be worth the economic cost. The economic cost was grossly underestimated and the live save were wildly exaggerated. This figure illustrates why indiscriminate lockdowns were a bad idea. The number of cases is a very poor metric of the COVID-19 pandemic because cases are not homogeneous. The biggest risk factor for death is age. Mortality rates shown are deaths per million population. The data are from the CDC. The virus is more lethal for older people. The most economically active young population is least likely to die from the virus. Indiscriminate lockdowns necessarily are less effective and more costly than policies targeted at the most vulnerable elderly population. Surprisingly, COVID-19 is not the leading cause of death for even the oldest age group. Even with all of the difficulties of determining that, that death was from COVID rather than death was with COVID, deaths attributed to COVID are not more than about 10% of total deaths for any age group. It must be noted that the CDC has stacked the deck in these numbers. These figures are determined from death certificates. The instructions for filling out the certificates often require that COVID be the cause of death for any patient with a positive PCR test. The hospitals get an extra payment for any patients treated for COVID, so every patient gets tested for COVID, even in the absence of symptoms. Even with these stacked rules, 90% of all deaths for each age group occur people who cannot be linked to COVID. This figure must be considered when analyzing excess deaths. This figure shows weekly death rates for five causes. The data are from the CDC. The brown curve is the current year. Gray curves are the most recent years. The difference between the brown curve for all causes and the average of the gray curves for all causes are called excess deaths. These excess deaths are tabulated by week. The CDC claims that two-thirds of excess deaths are attributed to COVID, but this statement really means that two-thirds of excess deaths are in patients with positive PCR tests. A different picture emerges when the deaths are divided by primary cause. The first panel shows deaths due to respiratory diseases. These deaths include respiratory infections, including influenza and COVID, but they also include deaths from chronic respiratory disease such as COPD. There is a spike in deaths beginning about March 1. The second panel shows deaths attributable to cardiovascular disease. Note that these deaths are more frequent than all the respiratory deaths combined. Furthermore, the spike in deaths from cardiovascular causes following lockdowns is higher than the comparable spike in respiratory deaths. This spike in cardiovascular deaths was almost certainly due to the lockdowns preventing people getting maintenance health care or being afraid to seek urgent health care. If a patient has a heart attack and dies, but the patient has a positive PCR test for COVID, is the cause of death cardiovascular disease or COVID? The CDC would have us believe that deaths with COVID are always deaths from COVID, even though all the other data suggest otherwise. The data suggests that lockdown reaction to COVID caused more cardiovascular deaths than any excess in deaths attributable the respiratory causes. The fourth panel illustrates deaths attributable to dementia. The level of deaths due to dementia is about the same as the level of deaths due to respiratory causes. Furthermore, the spike in deaths following lockdowns due to dementia was at least as great as the spike in deaths due to respiratory causes. There is no plausible way to blame these dementia deaths on COVID. The spike in dementia deaths were likely due to adverse consequences of isolating elderly patients from their caregivers due to COVID lockdowns. I am now going to demonstrate that indiscriminate lockdowns could not possibly save lives given what we know about the effective age on COVID-19 mortality. The population has been divided into two groups, young and hale on the left and elderly and frail on the right. For simplicity of visualization, we will assume the risk of death due to COVID-19 is zero in the young and 15% in the elderly. 
This is an oversimplification, but the conclusions I reach are generalizable if the young have a lower average and expected number of deaths from COVID-19 than the elderly. The other assumption is that the virus will inevitably spread through the young population, the economic activity. There are three types of interactions. Green interactions are among the young. Red interactions are among the elderly. Brown interactions are between one young person and one elderly person. If the red interactions are too high, there will be a chain reaction as soon as a single elderly case occurs. This chain reaction will expose all the elderly and the maximum number of deaths will occur, irrespective of what is done with the green and brown interactions. If the red interactions are sufficiently low, there is no chain reaction, and each exposure in the elderly becomes self-limited. There are two possible outcomes. If all the elderly get exposed via brown interactions before all the young get exposed via green interactions, then the maximum number of deaths occur. If all of the young people get exposed to green interactions before all the elderly get exposed, herd immunity is achieved and the number of deaths is less than maximum. Lower brown rates of transmission reduce deaths further, but lower green rates, without also lowering the brown rate, increases deaths until the maximum number of deaths occur. The peak number of deaths per day may be lower with lockdown of the young, but deaths accumulate for a longer period of time until total deaths are greater than what would have occurred without the lockdown. Here are the COVID-19 mortality data for Sweden as of September 19th. The data are from World Dominant. For the engineers in the audience, the mortality curve resembles an impulse response of a capacitor discharging through a resistor to ground or a reservoir discharging water through a pipe to the ocean. The first COVID deaths were reported around March 15th. The peak in COVID deaths occurred around April 15th. Sweden had a mostly laissez-faire approach. The people were advised to avoid crowds, wear masks, and distance themselves, but individuals were permitted to decide whether the benefits of social interaction were worth the risks. For all practical purposes, the pandemic in Sweden lasted about four months with a mortality of 582 deaths per million population as of October 8. Sweden serves as a control group against which the efficacy of restrictions to freedom of action can be compared. It is important to consider how changes to the model previously presented would affect the Swedish minimal, minimal intervention curve. An important class of red interactions, the interactions between elderly people, change the peak of the curve without changing its shape. For example, elderly people can be housed in a single room or elderly can be segregated into small groups with no contact between groups. Segregating the elderly into small groups would have a smaller peak than housing the elderly in a single room. New York is a case study on how increasing transmission among the elderly renders all other COVID policy moot. Note that the shape of the New York mortality curve is similar to that of Sweden, but the peak is about five times higher. The New York curve starts its ascent about the same time as the Sweden curve. The New York curve reaches its peak about the same time as the Sweden curve. And the New York curve has the same pattern of descent as the Sweden curve. On March 20, Governor Cuomo ordered the New York lockdown. Some of the effects remain to this day. On March 25, Governor Cuomo ordered that nursing homes be required to accept transfers from hospitals even if the patients were COVID positive. While the purpose of this order was almost certainly intended to open up hospital beds for incoming COVID patients, it was arguably the greatest COVID blunder to date. This order dramatically increased the rate that COVID was spread to nursing homes where the oldest and most vulnerable patients were housed. The disastrous nursing home order was not rescinded until May 10, but the damage had already been done. As predicted by the previous model, the lockdown had no effect once the transmission rate among the elderly had been increased. Let's consider how changing the brown interactions, interactions between one young person and one elderly person, or changing the green interactions, interactions among young people, would change the Swedish mortality curve. It is important to note during this analysis that total mortality, total mortality is the area under the curve rather than the height of the peak. Consider a proportionate decrease in both the brown and green interactions together. An example would be having both rates of interaction. This policy would decrease the rate of ascent, lower the peak, 
lengthen the duration of the pandemic, but would keep the total mortality unchanged. Consider a policy that decreases the brown interactions but leaves the green interactions unchanged. This decreases the rate of ascent, decreases the peak, decreases the duration of the pandemic slightly, and decreases the total mortality. This is clearly a desirable policy. Consider a policy that decreases the green interactions and leaves the brown interactions unchanged. This would be like closing schools or bars, which are attended by young people but not elderly people. This, in, this decreases the rate of ascent. The peak will decrease, but the descent will reach an unfortunate plateau rather than a decay to zero. This plateau continues as long as the lockdown prevents herd immunity or until all the elderly are exposed, whichever occurs first. The total mortality is increased due to vulnerable elderly people being exposed to infected young people for a longer period of time. Unfortunately, this was the result of most of the lockdowns that were implemented. The Texas data confirms the salient points made about lockdowns and deaths. Lockdowns can defer deaths from COVID-19 to some future date, but lockdowns cannot be sustained. The COVID virus has shown that it can survive a lockdown and resume its spread when the lockdown is relaxed. The lockdown must eventually be relaxed or the government will run out of tax money or the people will starve. The Texas lockdown started on March 19, shortly after the first deaths occurred. The Texas lockdown was sufficiently harsh to have significant effects. The lockdown did decrease virus transmission. The height of ascent, or the rate of ascent, decreased. The Texas peak was lower and later than the Swedish peak. Note the plateau and the death curve. Had the lockdown been continued, this plateau would have persisted for a very long time until Texas deaths exceeded what would have occurred under a Swedish laissez-faire policy. Phase three of the reopening occurred on June 3rd. Undoubtedly, based on the data, this event allowed the virus to spread into the high-risk population. This set in motion an average ascent comparable to the Sweden example. Deaths were deferred rather than prevented. As of October 8, when this figure was created, Texas mortality had cut up to Swedish mortality at 582 deaths per million population. However, Sweden has been essentially finished with the pandemic for about two months and is no longer accumulating deaths at a significant rate. Texas, however, has reached its plateau and is accumulating deaths much faster than Sweden. As of yesterday, Texas mortality was 622 deaths per million population compared to Sweden mortality of 586 deaths per million population. Thank you. leaves us time for questions now from the audience. I'll stand up just to call on people, but you can direct your question to everybody or any one of us. Gore. Yeah, I'm sorry, Amanda has the microphone. We'll bring it around to you. Uh, Dr. Sultan, so if there previously was a link between the Federal Reserve creating new money and there being price inflation, and this link has been severed because the Fed pays commercial banks interest to keep their reserves part of the Fed rather than entering into the economy, eventually the banks are going to want to spend their money because you, know, you, you have money to spend. So if all this, this money supply is increasing, but we see no inflation now, is this like water being built up behind a dam that all of a sudden bursts? Will we see a sudden spike potentially in price inflation all of a sudden in the future? That's an excellent question, and I'm not sure that anybody has the answer to that. Uh, the reason I'm not sure anybody has the answer to that is because we are looking at an unprecedented level of excess reserves held by the banking system. This has just never happened before, not only in the, in the United States, but as far as we can tell, anywhere. And the reason is pretty straightforward. There's an opportunity cost of holding excess reserves. If you're a bank and you're sitting on more reserves than you need, that the opportunity cost of that is loaning that out Right, the interest that you could be earning on an asset portfolio. So normally we don't think that banks want to do this. Uh, they only do because the Fed is paying them interest on excess reserves. So the question is if we wanted to go back to the other system where the total volume of reserves actually mattered for overall economic activity, I think it would matter very much how it were implemented. Uh, what we saw before 
the COVID-19 pandemic under Chairman Powell, to his credit, for a while there was a slow decrease in the size of the balance sheet. There was at least attempts, gestures towards normalization of the Fed's balance sheet. But then COVID hit and the central bankers overreacted the other way and now we're in that sort of situation. In terms of what would happen if you just snapped your fingers and went back to the old, old corridor system, I think it depends very much on what sort of opportunities the financial sector sees out there right now. And I think one of the clues is that interest rates globally are pretty low. That's not anything central banks can control. Central banks only have so much power. Interest rates are low because the demand for capital is low and the supply of capital is high. And as long as that's the case, I'm personally a little more skeptical of the flood theory, the idea that if we just went back to normal, there would be a sudden big spike in inflation. But there are some economists who are worried about that. Uh, there was a new paper just released by Bob Hetzel the famous monetary economist. It's a working paper through the Mercatus Center. And he's very much worried about what you just described. And uh, Bob Hetzel is way smarter than me. So perhaps you should take his advice instead of mine. Uh, I'd rather have you here, though, Alex. <laughs> uh, and by the way, for the record, uh, no relation to Chairman Powell. Uh, <laughs> okay. well, in the same vein, I was just wondering if you could talk if the rates of, uh, um, I guess, building up excess reserves in the ECB or the, uh, the Swiss uh, Central Bank, probably not the Japanese Central Bank, but probably not the Chinese Central Bank, but the ECB in particular is kind of storing up these excess reserves in their banking systems or not. At no, I don't rate. actually, I don't follow the ECB data that much. Yeah, I don't actually know what the time series on that looks like. I would assume that like the United States and like the Bank of Canada, they are sitting on some excess reserves. But there are notable differences in their policy implementation framework, so I'm not sure that we can infer the same things that we could necessarily infer from excess reserve holdings in the U.S. system. I think the broader point is that there's a lot of discussion about just how much effect central banks are having on interest rates right now. I'll be the first person to indict central banks for money mischief, but in broadly, Globally, interest rates are low right now for real factors that are beyond central banks' control. And I think that that gives them a little bit of breathing room. To the extent that that changes, I think the likelihood of having that sort of flood scenario that we talked about earlier becomes much more likely. All right, we have a question here, and then Professor Espuson. My question is just for uh, any of you here. Um, the fear factor has been elevated in, the, in all of this. Um, with regards to you getting to die, uh, if you listen to some of the news media. And that to me is a, uh, it's really a wrong approach. But um, I, want to, I want to ask a doctor uh, about Lubbock in, in, in particular. We see, the, we see on the news every night there seems to be, it seems to be like a sporting event. Uh, wow, there's 302 new cases tonight. Wow, that's great. The quarterback is doing a great job. We're getting more and more cases every day. The, quite, the question that I have for you is that these people originally tested, they, they, they tested, they tested positive. They have to retest in seven days. They have to retest again in 14. They have to retest again in, 20, in 21. Every time that they are, that they retest, those numbers are counted as an additional case. They're not, they're not backed out of that 302 every day. And that bothers me a lot because we're not being told necessarily the truth about the numbers of cases that are being act actual cases. I'm a 60, uh, Dr. Powell, I'm a 68 year old uh, retiree, okay? So I'm right here, right in the middle of all this. But, uh, uh, but here's the thing, here, I just have one thing about that is that, is that there still remains a 99% survival and recovery rate for this. The fear factor has just been enormous to me. And I'm, not, I'm bothered by that. Yeah, um, the, numbers, the numbers are not that much different than the flu in terms of mortality. Um, you know, this is worse. But it's not a lot worse. Um, it, 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 a person who's 85 years old, which is the highest age, uh, the highest risk age group, 
um, that person, those deaths are still uh, far more likely to be from other things than COVID. You are more likely to die from Alzheimer's or dementia than from COVID. Um, so yeah, the fear factor is a, is a huge problem. It paralyzes people from acting sensibly. Uh, and as I pointed out, if we had done what Sweden did, we'd be done with it. The Swedes have returned to normal. Uh, if you listen to all the discussion now, everybody just wants to get back to normal. Well, we could have done that if we would respond sensibly now, we could return to normal in a few months. Unfortunately, the medical powers that be, the New England Journal of Medicine, um, uh, Fauci, they will never be in favor of opening up. They want us to be locked down forever. I, uh, I will say before the next question, just Okay. The fear factor clearly makes our public policies worse as we choose things irrationally for public policies. But ironically, to the extent people's fear makes them over, overestimate the risk of disease to themselves, it mitigates the externality problem of their behavior being too risky because they don't account for others. If they're over accounting for themselves, then that actually decreases the case for any sort of regulation at all. Sure. Alex, uh, how long can the government keep on? persuading the banks uh, not to spend their money, not to use it. As long as the Fed still has funds available to pay interest on excess reserves, they can always give banks an incentive not to lend. The question is, what's the constraint? As far as I can tell from the accounting, the constraint is paying interest on excess reserves is eventually going to bite into the Fed's remittances to the Treasury. Into what? The Treasury. So for accounting purposes, whenever the central bank makes a profit, it remits all of that to the treasury. So whenever the central bank makes money, that means that your lifetime taxes are just a little bit lower. But that also means that if the central bank is paying commercial banks interest not to lend, that's money that otherwise would be going to the treasury. And throughout Federal Reserve history, treasury officials have often been a source of pressure, both formal and informal, on what the central bank does. So Fed remittances to the Treasury are not enormous, but it is something, and you could envision a scenario where Treasury officials are saying, look, the flow of funds that we're expecting from you are not sufficiently high anymore, can you let up a little bit? And if that's an actual meaningful constraint, then the Fed would not be able to pay commercial banks to just park the money and not spend it. And at that point, you would expect it to enter circulation, and then that's when we have to start talking about inflation. I don't think that scenario is very likely, but it is possible. All right, time for one last question, possibly. Up here, in the, oh, you're right there. You're with Tony doing while you're there. Here we go. My question, hopefully, is sort of good to answer, but I don't know how to aim for so whichever one of you knows the answer. Tell me about it. It's focused on regulation in terms of vaccines. Uh, you tend to hear a lot you know, that here they're they keep saying that some of these companies, these pharmaceutical companies, are trying to maybe hurry the outcome or the uh, bringing of this vaccine over to the market. And some people are worried about how fast this is going through the process and, and if this might have an implication on, on how safe it is for people. But at the same time, you do know that here they require, uh, there are a lot more regulations that require a lot more things in the trials as compared to other countries that extend the time that they need to test the vaccine for um, let's say for months, maybe more than a year, maybe two years, I'm not entirely sure, but I want to know if any of you could uh, expand a little on that. What's the reality compared to other countries? If this is really that much more regulated, and if that fear is something that doesn't make sense. Oh. <laughs> The vaccine, I mean, we could spend a whole hour talking about the vaccine, the trials. Um, the, the problems, uh, there are many problems with how they're bringing the vaccine uh, to, to bear. 
Um, a lot of the problems with what they're doing with the vaccine would go away if taking the vaccine is a voluntary act. But it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. It looks like once there is a vaccine, you're going to be required to take it. Um, and, I, and that makes a lot of these problems much worse. So if they do a trial that has a thousand people in it, they are completely incapable of detecting a one in 10,000 um, disaster. And if you give 300 million people something with a one in 10,000 disaster, that's a whole lot of disasters. Um, so we're, you know, we're gonna have that issue. The next issue is, well, will the vaccine even work? Um, and the way they're measuring that is not terribly encouraging. I mean, some of the trials, they determined the, va the vaccine was effective if you didn't get COVID for the next two weeks. Um, that's not really that encouraging. Uh, the only way you really could reasonably say the vaccine is effective is to have a control group and then see what's the, uh, the COVID rate in the, in the vaccine group and the control group over the next year. But the, none of the trials are gonna be conducted in that way. So there are gonna be a lot of problems with the vaccine. Historically, I don't have a lot of confidence because there are a lot of similarities between COVID and the common cold for which we have no vaccine. Um, and there are some similarities with flu, which the vaccine is uh, despite all the hype, uh, horrible. Um, the last five years, we haven't had a single year where the effectiveness of the vaccine was better than 30%. But that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Um, as best they can tell, um, antibodies, once generated, persist for about four months. So you're probably gonna be looking at mandatory vaccinations three times a year. All right. Well, on that high note, <laughs> thank you all for coming out tonight and uh, be safe doing the most dangerous activity you're probably going to do today, which is driving on Lubbock streets when it's icy. <laughs> See you all next time.